Well, hello there and welcome to my final interview of the year presented by me, Jack Lucas Caffrey. And I think my interviews of this year have almost became, sort, sort of came in full circle because I'm wearing the same shirt as I did in my first interview this year. I'm also having the same drink as I did th in my first interview this year. And I'm also interviewing a guy who happens to be an actor and a comedian, just like my first interview this year. This time, however, the actor and comedian I'm interviewing is the guy who played Silver the Hedgehog in my most favorite, like, most favorite ever guilty pleasure of all time, easily, Sonic 06. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pete Capella. How are you doing today? Hey, everybody. Hey, Jack. How are you, buddy? Oh, very good. Very good. I'm happy that you're here. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little buzz, which is not usually what happens during an interview, because usually it happens either way too early in the morning or something like that, or way too late <laughs> at night. So finally at a perfect time, luckily. <laughs> Great. I love it. I love it. Yes. Uh, wh where in Ireland are you at? Um, so I'm in, uh, so the radio station is in Dublin, in like uh, the okay. south, south of Dublin, in around Dundrum Town Centre. But I'm out in County Kildare, so kind of in the okay. middle of nowhere where nobody is. Uh, and it's lovely. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's great. That sounds, uh, listen, I'm in the, in the heart of Los Angeles, so something like that sounds perfect. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely perfect. It's great to have cattle and cows and sheep as your neighbors instead of I normal bet. people. <laughs> 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 Anyways, um, the first question I'd like to ask you today is, uh, how did you actually sort of get into the whole uh, world of acting? Uh, so... It, it was a couple of different things. Uh, you know, as a kid, uh, we were, you know, my, my parents loved TV and movies. They were always big fans. So it was always on. Uh, and it was specifically uh, The Wonder Years, uh, the first version of it in the uh, late 80s, early 90s that really got me thinking like, hey, this is what I want to do. Um, and so there was a short time uh, as a kid where I was doing like, youth plays and stuff like that uh but uh I, that quickly uh soccer or football uh took over my passion uh you know because as, when you're younger obviously uh girls were also a big thing and girls liked <laughs> athletes and they didn't like the the theater guys uh so i really leaned toward uh, i i played very very competitive soccer uh all the way up until i tore my acl in half um, and when that happened, I, it was very random. I also happened to me, I had a, uh, a substitute teacher, uh, at my high school who was like, I, and I was goofing around in class and he was like, Hey, uh, if you think you're funny, I'm teaching these improv classes and you should come. And I, we do these shows. Uh, and I quickly, I, when I turned 16, I essentially became a professional improviser. So I've been being paid to improvise since I was 16 years old. Um, and that led me back down the, the theater path. So when I went to university, I studied theater and TV and film. Uh, and, and so voiceover wise, uh, I also studied radio in college. So just like you, uh, <laughs> I was, I, I, I was a huge, uh, like I was huge into radio and I'm, I, this is the mid nineties if I'm aging myself. Uh, so <laughs> mid to late nineties, uh, so radio was still like a big thing here in the United States, you know, like, you know, Howard Stern was one of the biggest celebrities on earth at that time. Uh, and so for me, I was like, Oh, I want to have a career in radio as well. So uh, radio led me into voiceover work. So everything kind of combined with the improv, the theater and the radio to what I'm doing now. Gee, that's absolutely mad and incredible. I didn't even know that radio was a part of like uh you're sort of build into acting and everything. So that's, that's just crazy. Yeah. I, I had a re I had two radio shows all through college. Uh, one of them was uh, like a classic rock show where I was just a DJ doing the thing. The other one was a talk show called real talk, which was sponsored by Planned Parenthood here. Uh, and it was talking about uh, social and sexual issues on campus and so and i loved it it was really really cool uh and so yeah it was, it was a big part of my I, I i used to be so into radio that i would say at least every other night i would have a dream about hanging out with howard stern or some other radio personality like it was a huge deal to me 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you also mentioned there that you uh, did improv as sort of like your startup thing to do acting as well. And I believe you still do improv shows every now and again. So uh, what's it like doing improv? Because like as an experience, as my own, with my own experience of be being an actor myself occasionally, God, that improv stuff, it's challenging, but it's, it's, it's awarding <laughs> when you do it well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's just it. Right. Um, I think it's like any other skill where, uh, if you train hard enough, you know, like say you want to be a footballer, you train and you train and you train. And then suddenly, you know, a, a step over move going down the field isn't challenging anymore because it's embedded in your brain. And that's improv to me. Uh, it's a skill that I worked on and worked on and worked on until it became second nature. And now, you, you know, I, I could I could improvise in, in front of a crowd of 10 or 10,000 and I'd still be comfortable. Yeah, yeah, and that's always the the thing that you have to do in, in in acting is always be sort of comfortable on those things, and always, and sometimes as as well with like theater shows, which you did mention you do as well, you kind of have to have the improv there because if someone forgets a line, I mean, you kind of have to like, to you kind of have to stand in almost instantly. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think the big thing, Jack, is 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 people hear the word improv and they get frightened by it immediately. Yeah, but we didn't we didn't plan this conversation. No. We don't know how this interview is going to go. We improvise all day long, every day. Uh, so, you know, you go to the grocery store, you get into a conversation with the checkout clerk. You, you, you've you never met that person. You've ne never had, you know, you didn't plan your conversation, but you're improvising back and forth. So it's really just kind of putting yourself in that real life situation uh, and, and settling, just like any acting thing. It's just being in the moment. Yes. Uh, and, and so I actually don't, I don't think there's really much difference between straight acting and improv I, I it all comes from the same place for me yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and uh as well as that what was sort of like your first sort of like early work that you did as an actor once you became like a professional and everything the first film that i did uh is one called never among friends it is the worst thing <laughs> i've ever done um but not for a lack of anybody's trying, you know, it was a very young writer and director. I mean, he was, I was probably 24 at the time. He was maybe 20 or 21. He raised like $7,000 to shoot this film in, in his hometown in New Jersey. Um, it was like, it was a really wonderful experience. I didn't love the final product. It wasn't a great story. Um, <laughs> But that being said, uh, it was my first uh, experience of being on a set and like f everything from like, uh, you know, stuff going wrong to being pampered by, you know, the, the hair and makeup people. Like it was really, it was interesting just kind of seeing all parts of it. Uh, it was that. And then my other really cool thing, I, right around the same time, I was doing a lot of work uh, with, Saturday Night Live used to, I think it kind of still does sometimes. The After the opening monologue, the first thing that would happen is a sort of parody commercial type thing. Uh, and it, like at, at that time. And I was, I was just a background actor, but I was in a lot of them. Gee. And, um, yeah, and, and like, because I was an improviser and, and I, I would, I knew some of the people on set. So it was really fun kind of being, on a real professional set in New York City doing stuff with, with the leads of Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it probably gave you a bunch of experience as well, seeing how the, how the real deal would do it, you know? Like... Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, is there any sort of place where you can find those clips of you on Saturday Night Live uh, at, at all or something? I have, I have looked for them. I, I'd have to remember what the commercials were, and I don't even remember. It was so <laughs> long ago. <laughs> oh, oh. Also, if you saw me, it would be like, oh, there's Pete walking by. Oh, there's Pete walking by again. You know, it, it was nothing. But what was really crazy is uh, uh, I was there for Bill Hader's first show. Um, and I didn't know who he was because he was new on the cast. So at lunch, we sat down and I sat down next to him and I was just talking back and forth with him. And little did I know, he, you know, when, when we went back out there, it was like, oh, you, you're in this? You're in the show? I had no idea. Uh, and I recall that I met, I met him years later, uh, right before the pandemic, I met him again. Uh, and he remembered 
the commercial, like he remembered the sketch. He remembered everything about that day. He remembered sitting down, talking to me. I mean, the guy was so cool. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you also do voice acting as well, uh, which is uh, not a surprise to a bunch of Sonic fans at all. But uh, I'd like to ask you about it though, because uh, what is the sort of difference between like the live action acting where you're on the set, you're interacting with people, and then the voice acting that you do for whatever the, whether that be a show or an anime or whatever, a commercial even? I, I think it depends on the project. Um, but my answer is very little is different for me between live acting and voice acting. Uh, if you saw me in the booth, I look like a maniac because I, you know, for me, it, like to get the right stuff, uh, especially with Silver, who's all action and like, you know, he thinks he's a badass. I look like, I look like Billy Joe Armstrong in the booth, the, the lead singer of Green Day, <laughs> where I'm like in the same position, like just screaming at the mic, uh, I, 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 you know, I think physical choices are just important as, uh, as your other, like, you know, uh, mental and emotional choices. So, uh, I, I, physicality is a big part of my voice acting. Yeah, absolutely. I find that you like do voice acting, but you just kind of stand still. You're, it's, it, it, there's, there's no movement going on and everything. And I find in it, in the other actors kind of do the same thing. They try to move something, move a hand, move move around yeah. or yeah i i think the reason why um you see so many uh tv and film stars now doing voiceover work is because there's so little difference in the actual work you just have to be a good actor it's not so you know a lot of young voice actors or or, or you know want people who want to be voice actors will come up to me at conventions or whatever and say oh look here's the voices i can do and that's the first part of it. But in my opinion, the most important part is learning how to analyze a script and how to bring that script to life. Uh, it's not just about making silly voices. There's a lot more to it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and that can help you as well. Like if you can do a squeaky voice like this, that might help you get a role. But like you need to make that squeaky voice somewhat believable, you know, you have to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, that people relate to cartoons for a reason unless you're doing like you know toddler uh cartoons where you know they are just making funny noises just to get the kids attention but otherwise like if you're trying to tell a story you really need to make what you're doing believable and relatable you need to the the viewer needs to see themselves in those characters yeah absolutely absolutely Another thing you also do as well is uh, voice dubbing as well over some sort of animes or stuff like that. Uh, what is the difference sort of between like the dubs and the normal voice acting? Is there, Because I, I believe there would probably be slightly more of a challenge. Yeah, it is. It's definitely slightly more of a challenge. I mean, you're you're not going at your own pace. You're going at somebody else's pace. You know, you're 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 actually <clears throat> it's a whole other skill. You're, you're watching someone else's animation that's already been brought to life. So you're not only analyzing what's gonna what's happening in the script, but also analyzing what's already been done. So you have to respect both sides of that and really, you know, uh, sometimes you don't get to make the choice that you wanna make because it's already made differently for you, which is fine. It's yeah. just a different skill. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now let's sort of move on to Silver the Hedgehog in Sonic 06, because I think sure. that's probably where a lot of the people are going to want to hear about, oh, Silver, Silver, Silver. So uh, how did you get the role of Silver the Hedgehog in Sonic 06? So, uh, so I was in New York City uh, pursuing acting, um, still trying to get into radio, and I had a friend that I improvised with who uh, was working at a place that had a... a a VO setup. And so I recorded a demo and that was right when the internet was coming into play for casting. Cause at that point, you know, again, this is way before your time, but we're talking about it, You know, it's, it's the early two thousands. Um, my space is the biggest thing, you know? Yeah. So, uh, most casting was, most casting was done. Uh, you would, you had headshots and you had resumes and people would send them out to casting offices. It wasn't done as immediate as it is now. And so um, 
there was a website that still exists called nycasting.com. And uh, I had my voiceover reel up there and, and four kids noticed it and they would bring me in for auditions a lot. And so at the time, uh, I was mostly going in for bigger, deeper voices uh, for some reason. I, I have a pretty big range uh, where my voice is. Um, <clears throat> so I can do the deeper voices, but also my natural voice is almost Kermit-like. Uh, so, And I'm very well aware of that, uh, which I do a pretty damn good Kermit. Uh, and uh, and so I was, I had specifically, I had auditioned for some sort of enemy in a Ninja Turtles uh, cartoon that day. Uh, and as I was walking out, it was literally, I, I was literally almost out the door. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had opened the door and was walking out there and the, the director came out. She's like, oh wait, Pete, 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 Pete. Hey, do you think you could try this like 13 year old hedgehog? And I was like, I mean, yes, absolutely. Give me anything you want. Uh, and so it was a very last minute thing. It's not why I was called into the office. Um, they showed me some anime examples of like, hey, he's kind of like, not based off of, but like he's in the same realm as these characters. Uh, and I watched some of that stuff and I was like, great, got it. And I put it down, uh, left, and I didn't hear for months. And then I, it was months later that they called and they were like, hey, you got the Silver the Hedgehog, so. <laughs> oh, that's absolutely incredible. And uh, yeah, um, was one of the characters by any chance that they mentioned to you that Silver was inspired by, was, was, that, was one of the characters Trunks in Dragon Ball? I don't remember at all. I don't remember <laughs> who they showed me. That's the one thing I don't remember. Yeah, because um, it, there was a, like an official like sort of thing that was released by Sega describing all the characters in 06. And for Silver, they said, essentially, think Trunks from Dragon Ball. Oh, wow. Okay, so then likely, yes. And I'm pretty sure it was four kids doing Dragon Ball Z at the time. They might have been. I don't remember. Ah, uh, oh, God. I I don't even know. Like, I do know that, like, the who was composing Dragon Ball, like, in, around the 90s and 2000s, but I don't know. Was it four kids? I don't know. I don't I'm, remember, I'm not the yeah. biggest Dragon Ball fan to know. No, I mean, I know they, I think they were more I think Yu-Gi-Oh was really their big base and not Dragon Ball, but I could be wrong. Yeah. And the Pokemon as well. That was a big thing yeah. for them. Yeah, uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, Sonic the Hedgehog as well, when they have that as yeah. well. And uh, speaking of Sonic, so you did get to do Silver and everything. As you mentioned, you got the audition. You, you landed the audition. You won the part and everything. What was it like voicing Silver uh, in Sonic 06, because I believe you didn't really have uh, much interaction with any of the other voice actors. Yeah, no, we didn't. Uh, there was one time where uh, Jason Griffith was leaving and I was coming in uh, and they asked us to do some background voices together. So, you know, we were just like, you know, uh, NPCs in the background just yelling or doing whatever. Um, that was the only time I ever interacted with another voice actor in the game. Uh, it was to answer the first question. It was, it was awesome. It was scary. It was uh, artistically fulfilling. It was, I was sick as a dog. I've told this story before, but like it was winter in New York and uh, I was just like surviving on, there was a Starbucks down on the corner uh, like below four kids and I would go to the same Starbucks every time get the same tea and honey and I was surviving on that because I was like I can't tell them I'm sick I have to do this character right like I'm not going to make a big deal about it so I like had to push through having a cold and uh and doing this character and it was awesome man like it was <clears throat> myself and uh the four kids director and then a translator and the Sega director who was one of the creators of the game and he spoke zero English. So <laughs> everything I got was through a translator. It, it, I mean, it came, it was, I was the, the fourth person to get the information. So the Sega director went to the translator, the translator went to my director and then I was the last person to get it. Um, and it was really interesting. It was, it made it a challenge, but all the more exciting because that guy was so excited about 
everything we were doing and it made it really cool and fun oh yeah absolutely and and uh, and, and it's kind of mad though that you mentioned that you were sick during all the voicing of silver and and i was speaking about this to like uh, my radio engineer in dublin south fm we were speaking about like how is it the people that are sick sound better on the <laughs> microphone because it seems like everyone that gets sick Everyone that like we had we I, we we brought back like the 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 former presenter of the show with me to do a scene and he was sick, uh, uh doing a scene and he was like, God, he sounds better sick. <laughs> Everyone wants that cool raspy voice, right? Uh, and it's also <laughs> I, it, you're also having especially you know with with Silver who's above my normal register, I really had to focus on doing it right like making sure that it was the same and consistent. So I think having to like fight through the cold and come up with that consistent voice actually made that voice better. Now, I will say, uh, they didn't give me the script beforehand. So like I would go into the booth and be like, all right, here's your 20 pages that we're doing today. They never really explain, because of the how many things got lost in translation and stuff like that between the translator and the directors and blah, blah, blah. I never, there were a bunch of times where they tried to explain it. They, they didn't do a good job. And when I watch it now, I'm like, oh, I wish I knew what the hell I was talking about because I would have said this line differently. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, you know, I, I, I love the voice that I created for it. I, I love Silver. I love the character. But there are a lot of times where I was like, oh, that's what he meant by Iblis Trigger? Cool. I wish I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and and somehow, I don't know how you were able to pull off the Iblis trigger lines and everything with uh, with so little context like that, because it's somehow, somehow, I don't know how, it somehow seems well. Like the Iblis trigger line works well. And even the one line that uh, I find cr quite crazy that works so well is the chaos control line. Like yeah. where Sonic or Shadow out and Silver, they do chaos control together and they say it so simultaneously. You would have sworn that you and Jason were in the booth to say that. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. We were nowhere near each other. I have no idea how that worked. I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> Maybe they played the other people, but I don't remember. I don't think so. Yeah. And the only way that would have made sense is if they played Jason for me. Because I I don't know I don't remember how it happened but yeah it really is awesome. Oh yeah yeah they must have uh, they must have maybe said something like oh could you do it this way and then yeah yeah something I don't know um, and even the scene where uh, Blaze is sent to the another dimension and Silver loses his friend for his forever and everything I don't know how you were able to pull off the emotive like beats of that considering like no no communication with Blaze's actor well. I, I don't don't say no communicate. There was some, so that might have been relayed to me uh, in in a in a. I feel like that's what they said essentially is what you just said is like, hey, he's losing his friend uh, to to another dimension. I I feel like that was the instruction that I got. Uh, you know, they had that game was huge. It was a lot of. I, I mean, I I did a bunch of sessions. Um, it was a giant script, uh, and they had a lot to get through. So. I'm, they didn't keep anything from us because they didn't want us to know. It was just like, this is the time we have. Let's get this done. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, and I find that that seems to be the case, especially for like uh, a lot of uh, video game voice acting done in the 2000s and late 90s. Like I, I spoke to another guy named Paul Lucas who voiced in Shenmue, and he said that that's what it was like too. It was just, all right, we don't, we don't have much time. We need to just get through the script and rush through it as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They're also, at the time, uh, I don't think this was a big factor, but they were paying us by the hour. So <clears throat> the quicker they got it done, uh, the less they had to pay us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and um, um, as well as that, one of the lines that uh, everyone, everyone quotes, that Silver says all the time, that they always quote is, it's no use. I'd like to ask you about it because did you ever think that that line would ever become such a meme and such a <laughs> relevant part of Silver's character? No, no I, like not, a, not only did I not think that, that's a complete throwaway line, right? Like it's, 
so you're what I'm really focused on are the storytelling lines, the actual script. And then there's the action lines where you're like, ah, uh, uh, whatever you're doing, you know, um, and it's no use was one of those throwaway lines uh, that I probably recorded once. That was probably the <laughs> first take of it. Um, but did I know that they were going to play that every time Sonic went to attack him? No, I had no idea. And so it's so funny that that is the line that everybody connects to. Um, and, you know, if I'm at a convention, that's the line that I'm forced to say a thousand times. <laughs> that That's what I sign all the posters with, you know, like it's just what people want to hear. Yeah, it's not either. Well, I, I, it probably doesn't help that you hear it all the time in the Sonic and Silver fight. Like, yeah, that's basically... Right. That entire boss fight is basically figuring out what Pete's going to say. And if Pete says one thing, that's your time to attack Silver. That's right. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And uh, have you actually ever played uh, Sonic 06 for yourself? And uh, if so, uh, what did you think of the game? I did play it to a point. I don't think I've ever finished it. Um, which means I don't think I've ever even... I've seen... I've watched the story... But I don't think I played through the whole story. Um, it was fun. It was a, a you know a little disjointed as a game, uh, but they were trying something new. So <clears throat> I grew up with Sonic on Sega as you know a scroller going straight through, and so that's what I was used to. So, so the fact that they were trying to involve storyline and make it this big epic thing, I I, I love the I love what they were trying to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was. A, I think it was a very uh, experimental, ambitious game that sort of uh, fell short in a lot of places. The loading times, the slowdown, you know, yeah. sometimes the plot might be a bit jank here and there, but uh, I, I still like it. I still am able to play it and have a have a good time, at least. Yeah, I, same. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm not as good at it now. Uh, but there was a there was a time when I could where I could get through things pretty quickly in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't I haven't uh, beaten it in about in about two years. I, I should maybe try uh, see how good I, I am at it again because I know uh, I know Silver Story and Shadows more so Shadows those frustrated me. Oh my god, yeah. they were so goddamn hard. <laughs> they were hard. They were very hard. I actually what I really dug about the game is I like. Uh, the psychokinesis that they... I, I like how that played out with Silver, like being able to lift things and throw them. I, I thought that that looked and played really well. Yeah, that was very good. I, I enjoyed that. Like the just sort of Silver's like move that he had that was exclusive to him and no one else had was just... Yeah. Uh, that was really good. That was really good. I, and, and I kind of wish they were... they, I don't know, had a... Ha had that ability in other games and other Sonic games. It was just yeah, too good. I agree. Absolutely. And speaking of other Sonic games, Sonic Frontiers has uh, came out only a while ago, and uh, they've announced that they're going to be releasing a new story with new characters to play as. So, if Silver comes back, would you like to come back as Silver? Of course. Of course. Why would I not? I mean, <laughs> uh, I was I was very lucky because I got to create a character from nothing. Like Sonic already existed, uh, Tails already existed. Those characters all existed at some point during the, the you know in the Sonic world or in the Sonic universe. Uh, I got to create a character for the first time, and I, I that's a huge responsibility. Um, and it's a huge honor. And so I, any, t you know, I did seven games total. Um, if they asked me back, I would come back in a heartbeat. I, uh, the people at Sega were always great. Um, and yeah, I would love to do it. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the fans would absolutely love Yavaka Silver and everything. If he, if he does return, that'd right. be pretty cool. I'd like to see him in the movie too. Oh yeah, that that would be nice now. That'd be nice now, but uh, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't know their plans. I don't know what they're doing yeah, in that Sonic movie. <laughs> um, also, on, in regards to uh, other Sonic games as well, you also voice Silver in other Sonic games as well. Ones I can think of uh, offhand is uh, Sonic Riders Zero Gravity, which I have. Same with Sonic yeah. and the Secret Rings and Sonic of the Black Knight. 
Um, did they like call you back to do Lines of Silver or did they like recycle your voice by any chance? No, they, each, each one was recorded as a new thing. Um, and so some of them, <coughs> excuse me, some of them were recorded in New York. Some of them were after I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, but yeah, everything was a new game. Nothing was recycled. Oh, gee, that, that's quite interesting. And how, how did they uh, get your voice lines when you uh, moved over to uh, L.A.? Uh, every, I mean, just, just like we're doing now, everything was kind of, you know, on a much higher speed connection, but everything was done. Uh, I believe it was ISDN that we did it on. Uh, so I had my booth director here in Los Angeles, but the actual director was in New York. Hmm, that's very interesting. There you go. Now, let's move away from Silver now. I know we could speak all day about Silver, but we got to speak about other things you've done <laughs> as well. That isn't just Silver. Um, one thing that you did, actually, I'd like to speak about is a, a sort of stop-motion animation called The Most Popular Girls in School. Speak to me about that, because I, I, I had a little look at, like, an episode or two, and my God, it is it is bizarre, but it's, like, great crack to watch. <laughs> yes, it's uh, super fun, raunchy as hell. Um, that started, uh, where I, I don't know if it was both of their creators or one of the creators did one of those characters in an improv scene at improv Olympic in Los Angeles. And he had the idea to do it as a stop animation show. All the other people that are involved in it were people from the improv theater and, uh, and it just took off on YouTube. Like it just became this sensation. And like we used, it went from, we recorded it around his apartment dining room table to being at the YouTube studios, recording it in their booths there. Like it, it blew up huge. There was, you know, there were at one point there was talk of uh, multiple movies. There was talk of a TV show in the end, it all and nothing ever ha happened um, with any of that stuff, unfortunately. But the character was uh, <clears throat> it was interesting for me and important for me uh, because <clears throat> that character is uh, he's he's the high school quarterback, but he's also gay, uh, and I am a huge ally uh, to the LGBTQ plus community but I'm, I'm not gay, I'm straight. And so it was one of those things where I felt like I was treading dangerous ground of like, I can't make this stereotypical. I have to find like the reality in this character and I have to honor that. Um, especially because we're saying raunchy things. Yeah. Uh, so I have to make sure that the community itself is okay with me doing all of this. And so I talked to different friends and was just like how, how do you want to be represented at what, what is, you know, uh, is, am I, am I doing something wrong if I'm doing this? And, uh, so that's, you know, that's, I think where the heart of that character came from. And it's funny to say that, you know, that I found heart in a character that's, you know, saying cunt every other word, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. yeah, uh, it was it was really it's one of my favorite things that I've ever done. Oh yeah, absolutely, and yeah, I I think you you were able to pull off uh, the character of Tanner like so well somehow like it, and even and even like the the scenes where uh, you know the, the scene where he came out as gay in the like the the first episode he appears in like my God that's doing like so well it's just like you're gay yeah I am. Oh wait, are you? Yeah, yeah, I am. It's just so <laughs> well done. It's like yeah. it's awkward. It's funny. But it's like, wow, this is really good. I like this. Yeah, it's a really, really well done show. Uh, I wish it. I wish those movies or that TV show came to fruition because I think they would have been really as again. It's like a South Park where, like, you, you, yes, it's crude and crass, but it's also there's important stuff in there that needs to be told. So I, I, you know, I'm sad that that one didn't get the run that it should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still popular anyways. It still did very well. That, and they, there's like millions of views on a lot of the episodes. Sure, yeah, so it, yeah. It, it, it did have a good run. It wasn't like just a, a one-hit wonder and then boop, it just disappeared out of nowhere. Yeah, um, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
You've also appeared in other movies and shows and stuff like that as well. Uh, what other sort of uh, movies and shows uh, have you uh, appeared in by any chance? Uh, I mean, the, the the most consistent thing that I did for a while was uh, before our American football games, uh, comedian Rob Riggle uh, did something called Riggle's Picks, where he would we would do sketches and he would pick his two winning teams for that week or whatever, you know? Um, but they were re my friend wrote all the two friends uh, wrote, directed all the sketches. Uh, and it was, you know, I got to work with everyone from, from Rob to Betty. My first day on set was with Betty white. Like it Gee. was, just, it was so cool. Um, and we just got to play. It was just a bunch of comedians playing and there's nothing better uh, when that happens, you know what I mean? Like when you would get the opportunity to just have fun, like there was, you know, I would, the first one that I did, I, I was supposed to be like from, from Florida. So I said, Hey, can I do an, can I do an accent or can I do an, can I do this voice differently? And every time it was just like, yeah, do whatever you want. It, I think it's going to be funny. I, I trust you. And th there's nothing cooler than like the creators of something being like, yeah, I trust you. Oh yeah, absolutely. When there's trust between like the creators and the actors, I always think that uh, sometimes improves the sort of overall product when sort of everyone sort of comes together, suggests ideas, and then it becomes a real team effort like that. Absolutely, I I think everything everything should be a collaboration. Uh, it can't be just one person. If one person had all the answers, it would, you know, they would be the actor, the director, the the sound guy, the the crafty, you know, whatever it may be. Um, it has to be a full collaboration between all the teams or it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, is there any sort of uh, other video games that you appeared in that wasn't just Sonic or was Sonic like the only video game that you ever appeared in? Yeah, uh, oddly, Sonic was the only video game I ever appeared in. I've done a bunch of like, you know, uh, commercial campaigns. Like, you know, I was I was the voice of Visa for a little while. Um yeah, it, you know, the, the voiceover world was re it really changed in the last 10 years. D 10 years ago, I was going out for every single, like auditioning for every single major cartoon or video game that came out. And now that stuff is mostly just offered to celebrities. Yeah. So it's become a little tougher to, to break through. Yeah, I, I tend to find that. I tend to find that a lot. Like it, it's like the Mario movie is a perfect example of it. All right, we won't use Charles Martinet, the voice of Mario, for all these years. Let's just get Chris Pratt. He'll sound like Mario, no problem. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, um, yeah. I, it's funny because I ran into uh, I ran into Ben Schwartz a couple of years ago. And, oh, did and he's you? The yeah, and he's <laughs> the nicest. Uh, we're, we're, he comes from the improv world too. Uh, and he's the, the nicest human being. Uh, uh, he's just such a great dude. And I'm so happy for all his success. But I, I met him and I was like, oh, you're my voiceover nemesis. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, I auditioned for DuckTales and you got it. And now you're voicing Sonic and no one's called me. So, uh, and he thought it was very funny. But uh, again, just a super, super kind. I couldn't be happier that he's working so much because he's so talented. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You can't envy people too much, I no, find. No, no, no. I, I, everyone that is working is working because they've worked hard to get there and they deserve the roles they're getting. It's just become harder um, as a non-celebrity voice actor, you know, to break through. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, you also have been a, a stand-up comedian as well, so... Uh, uh, what, 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 how did you sort of get into the stand-up comedian stuff and uh, what's it like uh, doing that? Okay, this is going to get dark real quick, so I'm just going to warn you. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> my brother was murdered in 2013. Uh, and, and so uh, it was something that I, like, you know, was, was you know, I still live with. Uh, my whole family lives with that. Um, and I was like, huh. I, he was such a funny dude. I wonder if I could come up with a stand up set that honored him and made fun of him at the same time. Uh, and, <laughs> and that's where it came from. And, and like, um, I, it was, it was funny because I, 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 again, I've been improvising since I was 16, but I had never set foot on a stand up stage before. And I was like, okay, my friend is teaching a class 
I'm going to go to the class because I feel like uh, I'm always willing to learn. Uh, before I step up there, I want to like, I want to just hear where other people are at. I want to hear what she has to say. Um, and so when I told her that I wanted my first, it was a five minute set. It was like, when I, I, I want this to be about my brother's murder. And she's like, um, maybe you should try something a little easier first. And so uh, I ran that first set by her, like we did it in front of the class. And she pulled me aside afterwards. She was like, Pete, you won't hear me say this often, but I was completely wrong. That sucked. <laughs> Do it about your brother. And I, and I, and I did it about my brother and that wound up, you know, turning into like a 10 or 15 minute set, like specifically just about my brother's murder. Um, and, uh, it got me like kind of touring through, LA. I was, I was just booked on my first like outside touring gigs right when the pandemic hit. So I never actually got to do them, but it, it you know, uh, I, I feel like I'm a storyteller by nature. So it was kind of, you know, not easy, but like it came a little easier to me to get up there on a stand up stage. Yeah, yeah. And and that's absolutely uh I, I've never heard anyone like who's been a comedian have such a tragic thing happen to them be the inspiration for the whole comedy. So fair play honestly for to you to for doing it and ha having a laugh with it as well. Uh, you know, it's the kind of person my brother was. He his laugh was infectious and I even when I'm up there you know, ragging on him. You know, the the the, the first joke in that set is uh, is you know uh, is my brother was murdered ten years ago, which is the most middle child thing he could possibly do, because um, he was always just trying to get attention. And so I could just picture him loving that joke. Um, and you know, I I just I I don't think I I think if we can't find humor in 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 tragedy and also find tragedy and humor, then we're missing out a lot as human beings. Cause I think they're very much, there's a reason why you laugh so hard, you cry. And then sometimes you're at a funeral and you can't stop laughing and you're not sure why it's that same trigger, you know, it's that same heightened trigger. And so I feel like they live in the same realm in our brains and our hearts. And I, that's what I like to explore that type of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think, you, I think you've done it very well. Cause I, I've seen like a bit of the stand up stuff and like, surprisingly it's very funny considering the tragedy <laughs> it's like it's very funny and like i've seen comedians who've done comedian work for decades that aren't as funny as that like honestly well thank you i appreciate that but you know it's not for everyone i remember being in a specific crowd and there was an older woman there with her two daughters and i'm talking about you know my parents losing a, a child and she was not having it. She just did not. I could just, I just specifically saw her face just like, fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I'm understandable. It's, 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 you know, dark humor. It's, it's like Marmite or something like that. You either get it or you don't. And that's right. Absolutely. In, in the case of me, I get it. I get it heavily. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, with uh, and you mentioned as well that you're going to be that you tried to get it out of the country. Is there any plans to uh, bring the stand up work out of the country or somewhere in Europe or something like that? You know, the, the pandemic really um, it almost dead halted all of my stand up stuff. Like I stopped, uh, I didn't, I, I, I found it weird doing Zoom shows. So I stopped doing it and, and, and I focused my writing on to TV and film writing. So um, right now, instead of like uh, writing my stand-up stuff, I'm actually focused, my, my, my wife and I have, uh, we adapted a, a graphic novel where we wrote the pilot and we're pitching a show right now. So uh, we're just kind of trying to create bigger things. And you also uh, done some, uh, you also play some music every now and again and stuff. Have you made any sort of original songs or anything? Or is it just like playing in your own spare time? Yeah, j just kind of messing around with friends uh, type of stuff. Uh, you know, every every actor wants to be a rock star. Every rock star wants to be an actor. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, re it's really just, uh, you know, messing around, playing guitar. Uh, I, I love to play guitar and sing. Uh, I even like the, the the improv show that I'm doing right now is a, a fully improvised musical. Uh, so where we, we, I don't play, I just sing, but we improvise a Broadway musical. So all the music's improvised, all the lyrics are improvised, oh all my. the scenes are improvised. Um, 
yeah, it's super fun, <laughs> super scary, super fun. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's music's always been a passion of mine. My grandfather was a jazz trumpeter and singer. Uh, and so I kind of, I played trumpet growing up and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Always, always like to dabble. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, that's mad though, that the improv mu musical that you do is like improv music. Like, how does that work? <laughs> uh, you, you have brilliant musicians surrounding you. You have other brilliant cast members and, Again, it's just a skill. It's a specific skill where, you know, you, you know how a song structure works and you know how to, uh, you know, how, what a chorus is and, and, and like just finding ways to uh, feel what's important in the scene and, and, and bring out the emotions in the song. It's really fun. It's, it's, it is my favorite show that I've ever done. Oh yeah, that does sound like a lot of fun to do. It does sound like a challenge though, like because there's multiple stuff. It isn't just improv like with acting where you you just come up with a scene on the spot you have to come up with the melody the bass line the drum line the the singing and the lyrics all on the spot that oh god that sounds like a nightmare <laughs> but <laughs> super fun at the same time <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's really great it's super fun oh yeah absolutely and uh, now let's go on to sort of the future of yourself and your acting and everything. And uh, so what's the sort of future holding for you, like when it comes to upcoming shows and things like that? What, what are you sort of doing that's upcoming? Well, you know, it just like any other, any other actor, you're constantly auditioning. So, uh, you know, I'm auditioning for a TV film uh, as much as possible. Anything that comes my way and I feel like I fit the role, <coughs> um, you know, uh, those opportunities are wonderful. And. You know, I, it's not a, I can't even be specific. It's just a bunch of different TV shows come in and, 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 you know, I get auditions through my, I have a, you know, I have a manager, I have an agent, I have a voiceover agent, I have a hosting agent, I have a this agent and then that agent. So uh, you, you just get the auditions through them and, uh, you know, work hard to do that. Meanwhile, again, my, my wife and I uh, are, have created a show uh, that we're pitching to networks right now. Um, I'm also writing uh, a feature based on something that my brother and I were working on before he was killed. So, uh, yeah, just con constantly hustling is what you have to be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on the constant hustle. And is there any sort of uh, uh, upcoming games that you're in or any sort of things or anything that's like in the pipeline that's coming out like maybe in the next few months or something like that? I, I don't think so. I might be forgetting something, but I don't think so. Uh, I think... Everything that I like, I have a, a short film that was touring festivals and it just finished its run there. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, man. I, it's it's cold out here for the first time <laughs> in a very long time in Los Angeles and everyone's getting sick. Um, uh, yeah, I don't I don't think I have anything on the horizon. It's really just we've been working really hard on this show and then uh, again, constantly auditioning. So, I mean, I hope that there is. I hope that there's something that I don't know about that is coming up soon. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, which would be cool. That's, that would be absolutely cool. Well, Pete, it's been great speaking to you for uh, a, good, a, good, a good while, but uh, we have to end it somewhere. So, Pete, thank you very much for coming on. Is there any sort of last things you'd like to say? And uh, would you like to plug in the old socials? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, A, I just want to thank you. This has been a really, really fun interview. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm just very impressed with the, uh, the research that you do. Uh, so that's really, I mean, you watch stand up stuff of mine on YouTube. I guess you have to find it. So that was really oh, cool. Look, I did, I did more than that. I went through like all the cutscenes in Sonic 06. Oh my to, goodness. <laughs> just to, <laughs> just to hear what, just to, to, to remind myself of the story. <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, well, so thank you. I appreciate that. I love anybody who puts hard work into their art form. So, uh, yeah, uh, you can follow me across all social media at Pete Capella. So P-E-T-C-A-P-E-L-L-A. -E -L -L uh, follow me, follow me on, I, I mostly do Instagram uh, because uh, Elon Musk can go F himself and I, I now stay off of Twitter. I hate that guy. Uh, so yeah, find me, message me. I'd love to respond. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, J Jack. Thank you so much. It's been really, really fun. Yeah, yeah. Same, same as here, Pete. Thanks for letting me interview you. And you can find me simply on my YouTube channel, simply titled Jack Lucas Caffrey. You may already be on that if you're watching this interview on YouTube. But Pete, 
Thank you very much for coming on. And because it is coming close to the new year, and this interview is coming out on the 28th of December, uh, could Silver please say Happy New Year to all, all, all the Sonic fans? Absolutely. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, got to clear the throat for that one. Hey, everyone. Hope you guys have the best new year. Happy New Year. Happy holidays and kick ass in 2023. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs>